Hi friends, it's Eden here. I'm back with another video and today we're going to be talking about ingredient mapping, choosing botanical and gentle cosmeceuticals for a stellar LOX product line. Okay, so this is part three of our four part series. In the first one, we just did a general overview of, um, you know, what of, of what are the different issues people face when they have locks and um, creating a locks product line. Um, and then today we are going to talk, um, and in the, in the second video we went into a little bit more detail about that. Um, cleansing the hair and the scalp, nurturing the roots with minerals, creating strong hair structure, keeping locks feeling soft and hydrated, accelerating growth, minimizing dandruff, and lubricating the scalp. So I went over the perfect routine for locks. So if you haven't watched that video, you might want to go back and look at that video after this. Um, and that will explain to you how you choose what we'll cover in the fourth video, which is creating the, the perfect product line. So let's start with the herbs. You don't need to choose all of the herbs. Um, just choose a minimum of two, right? But for the for most people, four to six is going to be ideal in terms of the amount of herbs they should include. They might not show up necessarily in every single product, but they do need to be in a pool that you continually draw from as you create each product. So just to maintain a sort of cohesion and overall theme in the line, like you'll notice a lot of beauty product lines will name their entire line after one or two ingredients, like coconut and hibiscus, or, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, sacha inchi and apricots, or, you know, pomegranate and mango. And they're not just talking about scents, usually, that, though it could be a scent, but it's usually an ingredient line. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is still a bit iffy. Um, and so if you want to know more about themes, I do have classes on that. Um, I'll talk about it later. But for now, let's just focus on the herbs and the other ingredients that we're going to cover today. And you might want to pause the video and go get a notebook because it's going to be really chock full of information. And I suspect this video is probably going to be at least 40 minutes long, possibly an hour. All right. So there are so many different herbs you can choose. Um, and obviously I didn't put all the different herbs you could choose for your line, but I just thought that some of these would be helpful to consider. Okay. So the first one I'm going to talk about is, um, yucca and yucca is a desert plant from the southwestern united states it probably grows also in parts of um, mexico maybe other countries in central america i'm just going to pause this for a second because i think i have a candle burning here that is not helping my cause <laughs> okay that's better so so yucca as you can see is a really beautiful plant um, it has these amazing flowers that shoot out of it um, once a year. And with yucca, what you're using mostly is the root. It's the root of this plant that um, the indigenous people of the southwestern region where I live, where I, which I love so much, um, discovered that, you know, the root has saponins or soapy-like substances. So they would use the root to wash their hair. And so it also has great hair growth properties. Now when you see, when you look at a plant, a lot of times it'll give you indicators when it's good for hair. It could be either um, it's very mucilaginous, which we'll talk about in some other herbs later, um, that it grows really straight and spiny, as you can see the leaves shooting out of the, the yucca leaf, or just how the flowers just shoot straight up. So it, it kind of hints at a lot of mineralization to be able to achieve that sort of structure. And um, I first discovered yucca when I was living um, in Koreatown many, many years ago. Um, I was in my, probably in my 20s, and um, I lived in 
Koreatown, but adjacent to a part that I like to call Little San Salvador. And there were a lot of um, <clears throat> um, Central American immigrants who lived there. And once a year, I would see these flowers being sold in chains, like by the at the corner markets, where I learned about a lot of different things, including some of the herbs I'll be sharing in this presentation. But apparently, these flowers, um, they use them, they cook with them. Um, I was never brave enough to cook with them because I could never find someone who could give me a solid recipe, but apparently they're really good in an omelette or what have you. Um, and I wonder if they would actually be really good for skin or hair too. Um, unfortunately, at that point, I wasn't fully experimenting, um, but I should have tried um, making something for skin or hair with those flowers. But the root um, is available. I've seen it at Mountain Rose Herbs here in the United States. And they're probably, if you're going to manufacturing, they could probably source it for you from anywhere. Um, so it's a really nice sort of plant that has a nice story. And there's a whole bunch of traditional lore about it as well, if you wanted to look into that. But yuck is a really good plant for that. It's known for growing hair. Um, it's great to include in a cleanser. Um, but you could also just infuse the herb. Um, you know, it's great in an oil because it's because of the saponins, it's probably going to have an effect in in cleansing the scalp. And um, you could pour, also infuse it in a vinegar. So yucca is is a nice touch to your Lox brand. Bamboo, bamboo, um, as you can see has the potential to grow really straight and tall. Maybe some people only know it from going to sort of um, little Asian shops or whatever and seeing, you know, the smaller bamboos that you can keep in your house for luck and so forth. But bamboo has a lot of great associations with it that are included, including, you know, luck and happiness. But it also has a really um, great amount of silica. So silica is going to be something that reinforces the hair structure. We talked about that in the last video. Um, it also gives a certain kind of sleekness and shine to hair, uh, to free hair if you're watching this, but you're looking to create a line for free hair. And, you know, a, a, a lot of form to hair. So it's going to be strengthening for hair. It's going to provide shine and luster. It's also a very sustainable ingredient. So if you're creating a line that's designed to be eco, bamboo is a nice touch. And just look at how straight and tall it grows. Um, when you look at plants, you know, even if you've never heard that it's good for hair, just, just look at certain indicators. Um, nature always gives you clues about what you can use things for. I know bamboo is also really great for filling out lines on the face, so it's a nice thing for anti-aging um, skin care as well. Just think about that and rosemary rosemary is so easy to grow um, I speak to so many people over the phone who have rosemary growing in their yard you know um, so that's a nice way to cut down on ingredient costs if you're making products yourself but you know you can easily grow rosemary this is a picture of a bush in flower so it doesn't always have the the flowers on it obviously, but um, rosemary is commonly recognized plant. You'll see it at farmer's markets, you'll see it in supermarkets, you'll see it dried, you'll see it fresh. So, um, you know, you'd want to use the dried form in, you know, oil infusions, but the fresh form is really nice anywhere else where, where water is involved. And it really is a remarkable underestimated plant because it has several properties that we find useful for hair in general and for locks in particular. And one of them is that it has a sort of cleansing effect. So it cleans the pores of the skin and the scalp. It um, is antibacterial, um, antifungal. So it's gonna help with dandruff and any kind of weird skin conditions. It's anti-inflammatory you know, so it helps with in inflammation. Um, it really regenerates the cells. It's full of antioxidants and it regenerates the cells uh, at the um, follicular level. So it's going to kind of promote hair growth and promote healthy circulation of the scalp. Um, 
with a healthy circulation of, you know, blood, you know, underneath the scalp at that level. And all of that is going to encourage growth. It also helps with shine. It creates shine in the hair when you use it as a rinse or as an ingredient of some sort. Um, and it helps to darken dark hair. Um, so if most people who have locks are going to have dark hair, they're, obviously there are going to be some people with red hair and blonde hair and so forth. And there are herbs that, you know, are nice for color with that. Like chamomile is great for blonde hair. We'll talk about that later. Or, you know, <clears throat> people who have that very, very, very light brown hair or people who've dyed their hair. Um, and rooibos and, um, there's another one that I'm not thinking of. Probably hibiscus would be great for red hair. But rosemary is really wonderful for all those things, and it smells so fresh and fragrant. Um, so really consider having rosemary in your arsenal, um, and it can be in this form where you make a tea out of it. Um, rosemary essential oil is awesome. Rosemary hydrosol is awesome. And you can also make infusions of rosemary in vinegar and in water as a tea, obviously, and in oil. <clears throat> sage has a lot of the properties similar to, to rosemary, um, also being antibacterial, antifungal. Um, I would say that sage is one of those ingredients you don't want to include in a line that's for women who are pregnant or nursing, just because sage is known as an anti-galactagogue, so it dries up breast milk for women who are nursing. Um, and it also can cause uterine contractions. So you want to be careful if you're pregnant. But otherwise, it, it has a lot of the same properties as rosemary, um, great for dark hair, shine, um, removes crusty stuff from the scalp, um, really helps with hair growth, um, great for controlling dandruff. So it's an awesome plant for um, locks and rosemary and sage have all those qualities and they don't actually dry the hair out because a lot of times plants that have those properties will might also dry the hair out all right so that's good to know <clears throat> in the case of the hydrosol the hydrosol might be a little bit astringent so you'll always want to couple it with a good humectant for both sage and rosemary really most hydrosols are a little bit astringent and we'll talk about that in a little bit Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is Amla. Amla has been getting a lot of play in the natural hair community um, because it's one of the herbs, traditional Indian herbs in um, Ayurveda. Ayurveda is the thousands, many thousands of years old. I don't know how many thousands, but it's at least two, maybe more years old medical system of India. So a lot of times in the natural hair community, we kind of get caught up by calling it everything Ayurvedic. However, um, it's a total system of medicine that, um, you know, kind of divides people as well as conditions and illnesses into three major types. So I'm not going to go into a whole thing of Ayurveda, but I'm reluctant to call Indian herbs Ayurvedic. Um, you know, you know, to call lines Ayurvedic when they're not based on the doshas, which are the three different types, but we can say that things are Ayurvedic inspired, you know, unless you actually are Indian, then you can say whatever you want, but because I'm not Indian descent, I don't want to culturally appropriate their stuff, um, and I want to give the, the respect where the respect is due, but Amla is one of those plants, um, really it's the fruit that is used, as you can see here, this pretty green fruit. Um, usually when it's dried, the powder looks pretty brown like this. Um, you can also get raw amla powder, which tends to be a, a much lighter brown. Um, but even the, the dark amla powder, which is commonly used, is really, really great. And it's known for thickening the hair. It's known for accelerating hair growth. It's known for conditioning the hair and softening the hair. Um, it is very, very high in vitamin C. It's one of the most, it's probably in the top three or four fruits that 
in terms of vitamin C level. So that's going to be really great for the scalp and incorporating vitamins in that way. And it's great used in rinse, in shampoo, in oil, what it, however you choose to use it. Obviously, if you're in a country where you can get fresh amla juice, that's awesome. But most of us cannot, <clears throat> unless you're watching, of course, from India. So unless, of course, you're watching from India, then, you know, in which case you probably wouldn't be looking at a LOX <laughs> masterclass, but who knows. So um, nettles. Nettles grow all over the place in Europe and in North America. Um, but, you know, the, because they're such a potent herb, you can find them in herbal stores almost anywhere in the world. Um, they are so rich in iron. They are rich in a lot of different mineral, minerals. Um, so it's a great pregnancy drink for women to make to drink nettle tea like in big amounts um, But it's also known for soothing skin conditions and the irony is that this is called stinging nettles because if you look at um, Some of the leaves if you had a close-up look at the leaves they have little stingers on them And so once the leaf is dried it doesn't sting anymore or once the leaf is cooked it doesn't sting anymore um, but it is a very, very healing plant. If you live in Oregon or, you know, Washington state, you know, you could probably go to the woods somewhere or a hillside and just pick it. You know, you probably wouldn't even need to buy it and it would be even more potent. But most of us are going to need to buy it. So it's, it's really rich in minerals. It really helps to nourish and mineralize the hair at the root level. Um, so that means that your hair is going to grow stronger and not break off as much. Um, some people excel, say it accelerates hair growth. I don't know about that necessarily, but I do know that it really nourishes the hair. And when consumed internally, and if you remember the first video, I think it was, where I showed you my hair show pictures, I was drinking a lot of nettle because um, I had both pregnancies um, with that hair and... I think that really helped to mineralize my hair and keep it really strong and um, ropey as opposed to being brittle and, and breaking off. So mineralizing with nettles is a really good idea. It also really helps with dandruff control. And I just want to apologize for my voice mid, you know, I thought it would be ready for this. It's just kind of going up and down as I've been going through a spell of illness like I shared. But I'm just going to soldier through this and hopefully my voice will be tolerable to you guys. So oat straw. Oat straw is a great partner to nettles. If you're drinking tea, if you make nettle and oat straw tea and you drink it continually, it will really nourish you inside, internally. It'll balance a lot of internal conditions and it'll give you amazing hair and skin. Okay, so oat straw is also full of minerals. Um, <clears throat> it's also another one of those that's great for lighter colored hair, but it works well for darker colored hair as well. So the mineralizing qualities of oat straw are going to be really, really helpful in a line for dreads. So hibiscus, um, you know what? I just want to go back to oat straw for a minute. Let me see. Okay. Oat straw. It's the actual stock here, as you can see right here. It's the stock that you're using when you drink oat straw tea. People also sell things like oat milky tops, which are these little buds right here, right before they start to grow into the grain that we know as oats. So that's completely different from regular oats, which we'll talk about later. But so when you're buying oat straw, make sure you're buying oat straw, right? And not just regular oats. And you can use regular oats for other things, but it's the oat straw particularly that's going to be highly mineralizing. Okay, so hibiscus um, is commonly found almost everywhere in the tropics. It grows really well too. I see a lot of people growing hibiscus here in the desert. Um, usually the hibiscus flowers, dried, is what we buy, and we can infuse that into oil. We can make a tea of it, we can infuse it into vinegar, and it is so softening for the hair. It, it really helps the hair to feel soft. 
which is something we really desire with locks. It also has a slight conditioning effect because um, I'm not really into using conditioners with locks because I think that a lot of the things in traditional conditioners um, actually build up in the hair and then yes they'll make the hair feel soft temporarily but eventually the build up you know will make hair feel harder and it'll give hair discoloration and just a general yakiness like when you cut it you can just see nothing but build up inside so hibiscus is a nice way a, a nice thing to incorporate um, in alternative conditioners bring raj this is another one of those um plants from the ayurvedic um you know collection of herbs and it is really probably one of the kings of hair growth it really really will help hair grow my only thing with bringraj is that it does kind of have a slight tangling effect um, I don't know how to say, which might actually be really helpful for dreads now that I think about it. But in free hair, you always want to combine it with things that are softening and detangling and smoothing because it does kind of have that tangling sort of hardening effect. Um, but Bringraj is amazing for hair growth. It's really going to strengthen the hair shaft. Um, it's going to help with reducing gray hair or reducing the pace at which um, hair grays and um, helps with darkening hair and um, some people say that it helps with dandruff control I don't know that I've really seen it to do that I haven't experimented with it on its own I've always put it with other dandruff controllers so I can't really testify about that um, but some people say that it does help with that so Bring Raj is definitely one of those things, especially to include in a rinse out application as opposed to a leave in application because of the sort of tangling hardening effects. But in a rinse out applica application, it really is an awesome thing, especially if you're focused on hair growth. So Shikakai is also one of those, um, you know, Ayurvedic um, plants. This is what it looks like growing on the tree, right? And sometimes there's two plants, there's shikakai and aretha, right? So aretha looks more like soap nuts to me. It's also called soap berries, whereas shikakai um, looks a little different. But sometimes people alternate the two in terms of the translation. They're clearly two different plants, but the translation into English, you just never really know. So it's best to, if you want Shikakai, to buy Shikakai. If you want Aretha, to buy Aretha. Um, but if you're buying soap nuts, you know, just call them soap nuts because you don't know which it is. But this looks like soap nuts to me. And so basically, this is like a natural shampoo. So it's great to include in the... Um, in the shampoo part or cleanser part of your um, lox line it's a great thing to include in a vinegar wash you know you could do half vinegar half um, decoction of um, soap nuts or of shikakai or of aretha and um, it'll create a natural soapy substance that cleanses the hair and scalp really well it also makes the hair soft and it and it also acts kind of like a natural conditioner you could infuse the dry powders into oil as well. And so that could be even a scalp oil for in between um, washes to just kind of help keep the scalp clear. So this is Aretha, like I said, um, which looks like soap berries. And then chamomile. So chamomile is very interesting to me because it looks so different dried than it does um, in the field. Like I never even knew that chamomile had white petals <laughs> until I saw it at the farmer's market and I had to ask what it was. And I was like, really? You know, so anyway, that's why I put the two side by side like this so you can recognize them. But chamomile is really great for highlighting blonde hair. Um... I don't think that it necessarily lightens dark hair, um, but if you have blonde hair or really light, light brown hair, um, whether it's naturally that way or you've dyed it, this is a great way to, to bring those highlights out. 
Um, it's really gentle and soothing to the scalp. People who have scalp conditions, if you have eczema or psoriasis in the scalp, this might be something that's really gentle and soothing and helpful for that. So it, it could be a good thing to, to include. And if you, if you have a scalp that's problematic like that, like a combo of chamomile and calendula, would be really great for soothing that condition specifically um, and some people say chamomile is a hair grower because I have dark hair and I have my children have dark hair um, I, I just kind of don't worry about including chamomile <laughs> in things generally like maybe some skincare things but I don't really experiment with it hair wise so I don't know that it would necessarily grow hair but I do know that chamomile can have a very numbing effect on things and so things with a numbing effect generally speaking do help to stimulate this the cells somehow so that could actually really help to be that could be part of what gives it regenerating qualities that people claim grow hair aloe vera okay so this is one of those just magical plants internally topically head to toe um, so as far as dreads are concerned it really is going to help to grow strong hair it really works as a great conditioner to give a more conditioned look and feel to the hair um, sometimes it can feel like a little bit hardening but it softens over time um, if you just kind of leave it be um, I really like alternating when I have locks between twisting with aloe vera gel and twisting with with shea like every other wash so if you do have a gel aloe vera is really important to include or you could just sell straight aloe vera gel and enhance it with some extracts and some essential oils for people to um, use to twist their hair and aloe vera is readily available it's easy to grow on your own even though I recommend that you buy aloe vera just because straining it is just so hard but if you were to slice it see how it's sliced like this and then you take you know three to four inch or that would be what like about six to eight centimeters um, chunks and then you slice them in half lengthwise right like um like across here right as opposed to across this way and then you use those slabs to um, apply to the hair because um, you can mold it and bend it and you just hold the, the, the green exterior part and you can put that down the hair shaft. That would actually make a really, really great conditioning treatment for those of you that are working in a salon and doing people's hair. Um, because one leaf will probably cost you anywhere from three to four bucks if you just go to a health food store or if you live in a neighborhood where you know people are selling aloe leaves on the street and if you live in certain immigrant neighborhoods you will see that or you can just grow your own um, and there are also places where you can you know order bulk um, aloe vera leaves just delivered to your door and they last pretty long it's only once you cut them that they start to deteriorate but on their own they could probably last even without being refrigerated for a while and once you cut them even refrigerated they will last for a while as long as you cover the the open bit but that in itself would be a wonderful conditioning treatment and then you don't have to deal with trying to strain the the fibrous bits which we also don't want stuck in our locks right so um, that would make an awesome conditioning treatment so nopal cactus prickly pear has a lot of the same succulent softening qualities that aloe has um i forgot to mention that aloe has um, polysaccharides which are long sugar chains that really kind of give it a lot of its healing properties it's very much a humectant so it attracts moisture it also helps to deliver nutrients at a deeper level so it acts like a carrier that delivers nutrients to a deeper level of the hair shaft and so nopal cactus does the same it's also prickly pear and some of you know prickly pear oil is really really expensive but you don't have to use the oil the oil is nice <laughs> for both hair and skin but it's super expensive so unless you're creating a very high-end line I would avoid the oil um, however 
the fruit and just the pads. See these pads? This is frequently what people recognize as nopales or nopal cactus, which um, desert dwellers eat like the whole thing. Um, and the pads obviously are more abundant than the fruit and are year round, whereas the fruit is more seasonal. So the pads and the powder derived from the pads is so much easier to afford. Um, for those of you in Southern Africa, I know that growing up in Zimbabwe, um, we call this Madoro feel, right? And um, I have a subscriber um, in South Africa that I correspond with and she gave me, I can't remember if it's the Zulu or um, um, Osa word for it, but you know, they have a, a, a word that's very similar sounding. So if you live anywhere in Africa, you might also have these naturally growing because they grow all over the world, really. So um, that's definitely a consideration to use the powdered form of that. Or if you're making a tea, you could just make a tea of it. Um, and it, it is really succulent. It helps to grow the hair. It's very, very mineralizing. Anything that's sort of a succulent plant or a cactus plant like this, usually naturally grows in arid areas so it knows how to store water so it's bringing that same quality of storing water to the hair in addition to all the minerals and also aloe and nopal cactus are both great things to add for healing the scalp um, sometimes people who have aids for example have a lot of lesions on their scalp um, so having things that help them heal those lesions these are kind of um, botanicals that you would include in blends for them. Okay, so now we're gonna transition into other types of plant derivatives that aren't necessarily traditional herbs as we know them. Um, so let's look at rice. So, you know, there's a rice water craze in the natural hair world, and definitely you can use um, fermented rice water as a conditioner, there's tons of videos on that. You can look it up on YouTube, I won't go into that because I don't want to make this um, recording too long and it's probably already um, pretty long yep um, okay good for a minute I thought that I wasn't recording but I'm recording okay um, so in any case um, let me go back here okay so so the thing with rice is you can use fermented rice water um but it is a bit stinky so i would only use fermented rice water in a salon as a conditioning treatment and then you know they rinse it out you rinse it out and then you do the spray and whatever else you're going to do to um condition and style and twist the locks um but in terms of you, there are other ways of incorporating the benefits of rice and its its conditioning aspects and growing aspects. And there are a lot of products on the market that are rice derived, including um, foaming rice cleansers, um, rice proteins, um, you know, rice solution, which is kind of like an alternative to glycerin that I'll talk about later. But rice can be a very interesting component of your line and um, a lot of cosmetic chemists will, will know that there are a lot of rice derivatives that work that are really softening to hair. Um, whether they have the same growing properties as the other things, I'm not sure. Um, but I think it's the inositol um, that helps with um, the growth with rice. And if that's present in other things, then obviously it'll help with the growth as well oats oats also has a lot of derivatives oat proteins um foaming oats uh which is kind of like a a cleanser that you would include in a shampoo at a small percentage you wouldn't use it at like 40 percent a because it's very expensive and b because um, you don't need that much but if you just used it at five to ten percent much like the foaming rice it would still have the same softening effects that you're looking for and would be kind of different. Um, it could also work well in a rinse out conditioner as well for, um, for dreads. 
Um, and there are also other ways to include oats. Um, you can do things like oat milk, um, where if you take whole grain oats and you soak them and then you just blend them and then strain it with um, a nut milk bag or a fine mesh strainer, and then you can use that oat milk in your shampoo. That would be a great way of incorporating the softening um, qualities of oats in there. So marine botanicals. Marine botanicals go without saying they are very juicy. Look at this kelp forest that is growing somewhere in an ocean. Um, so it's growing underwater. Usually if you put any other plant in water, it will shrivel and die because salt water is so saline. It is just full of salt, right? Um, so it would the salt would draw all the water out of the plant. But this um, is so mineralized. Uh, see, see marine botanicals or, you know, vegetation that grows under the sea is so highly mineralized that instead of having the water taken out of it, it's able to draw the water into itself. It has more minerals than the actual salt in the ocean. So it's able to reverse that process and have the osmosis work in its favor instead of um, to its detriment, which is what every other plant would have to do, right? So it brings that same quality to the human body it brings all those minerals to the human bodies so eating a lot of seaweed but also you can just infuse the seaweed dried seaweed into oils you can create a tea out of the the herbs um, but there are also a lot of cosmic cuticles that are out there like sea kelp bioferment um, and algae moist from algae moist oh I think is what they call it from formulator sample shop all of those are really um, moisturizing. They're nice alternatives to glycerin. Um, they cost a little bit more, but they're going to help to mineralize the hair um, and maybe condition the hair a little bit without creating that stickiness. And some of the marine, um, you know, extracts are going to be gel-like, so they can help with twisting the hair as well and just kind of creating that hold. Um, so that's a nice way to make your product line more elevated and special. Um, guava. Okay, so you can use guava fruit powder. I've seen probably if you're working with a manufacturer, they could make a more sophisticated extract. But if you're working at home, you can use guava fruit powder um, in your shampoos, in your leave-in sprays. It's really, really softening to the hair and it smells really amazing. Um, and the leaf. Guava leaf is a notorious hair grower. Um, it also helps to soften the hair. So that is nice to include in infusions. Um, oil infusions, if it's dry, I don't believe in putting wet um, plants in an oil infusion because then you could have bacterial issues. Um, and then, um, you know, but if it's any other kind of infusion, that's aqueous um, or vinegar based. You can use the fresh leaves if you have them. A lot of uh, my subscribers are in the tropics, so they might actually have access to this. Or if you have a garden, you could easily go to a nursery and buy a guava fruit, um, a guava tree and plant it or several, right? Um, as you can see, the, the leaves are pretty massive. Um, I have seen the leaves sold on Amazon in various countries. So, you know, that's also something that you could do. The guava leaf is, is really great for growing hair and softening hair. So there are other fruit extracts. I've seen cucumber peel. I've seen cucumber extract in glycerin. So the peel is obviously just going to be the peel. And you see how sleek cucumbers are. So it has that kind of same quality as bamboo. And the peel is also really high in silica. Um, the fruit is going to be really, really moisturizing because cucumbers are like I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a really high percentage of water. I want to say it could even be as much as 70%. So it's a very hydrating substance to the hair. It's just going to attract water to the hair and trap it in there. Mango is very softening to the hair. I'm not talking specifically about the butter in this case, which I'll talk about later. I'm talking about the dried fruit powder or an extract of the actual fruit, the flesh. 
really really softening to the hair um it also has a lot of vitamin c so that could be good for the scalp too as does the guava watermelon is another really high water content fruit that is going to make the hair just really nice and juicy um avocado i've seen bioferment of avocado um i think it was not preserved in a way that was ideal but you know if you were going to manufacturing they could always change the preservative for you and you could incorporate that so you have the nice probiotics as well as the lovely qualities of avocado for softening and nourishing the hair and providing those nice oils for the hair um, banana banana oil is harder to get you could make your own banana oil by um, infusing the powder into the an oil but the powder itself um, mixed in water it really helps with elasticity um, and we talked about that before in in the last video but that's gonna be the one thing that I know for sure is great for elasticity um, and you know if you're mineralizing the hair it's likely going to end up being elastic too if you're mineralizing it well enough and lubricating it well enough that will create elasticity but banana on its own is a is a um, has qualities to it you know how when you when you mash a banana and it gets all slimy um, that really helps with creating elasticity in the hair um, and then tomato okay so I brought up tomato specifically because there is a product called lycopene bioferment and it's obviously tomato derived but um, there are claims that it kind of helps kind of has the same qualities that um, cationic um, substances um, or quats have which is usually we avoid those in lox products because they are conditioners and so they build up in the hair um, and it's fine when you have free hair because you're always washing your hair and then putting the, the the quats on top so the washing process creates a negative charge and then the quats have a positive charge so they adhere to the negatively charged newly washed hair and then kind of help the cuticle to lay back down and look smooth so it gives us that polished look that we like in conditioners um, but there is the build-up issue so lycopene bioferment really helps to create that conditioned look without the build-up so that's another thing that you might want to consider um, it is harder to do when you're working from home and you're creating the product yourself because currently the the last time I looked the lycopene bioferment they had was preserved with parabens so I couldn't use it however um, if you're buying a large enough quantity they would change the preservative for you so you could always contact them at formulate a sample shop um, and ask them to do that or if you're working with a chemist you know you can have them sort that for you so hydrosols so this is um, some hydrosol equipment um, at someone's farm and it looks like they're about to distill some lavender hydrosol um, hydrosols are really interesting because they're gonna add fragrance to your stuff especially things that might not smell as great like um, vinegar <laughs> rinses and so forth um, but they also have a slight cleansing quality so they're gonna help to remove some oil from your hair and scalp so it kind of becomes a double whammy and they often have in fact they always have medicinal qualities too so they're gonna bring a lot of the aspects of the herb to you um, one that is softening and conditioning for hair for sure is rose but if you don't want a floral smell um, you know lavender and rosemary work well as well but I know lavender and rosemary and probably all the sages um, do have a slight astringent sort of feel um, cucumber hydrosol is nice and it has that nice cucumber smell chamomile hydrosol so there are a lot of different hydrosols that you can consider vinegar okay so here's the famous Bragg's raw apple cider vinegar if you can get raw apple cider vinegar with the mother that would be awesome but honestly I have seen um, a lot of benefits from just using plain white vinegar um, if you if that's all you have access to or all you can afford in bulk um, that is going to also have the same um, balancing properties in terms of um, cleaning the hair um, and kind of you know balancing the scalp pH 
um, the raw vinegar is just going to have more nutrients. So it's going to have more benefits, but you can still do really well with just the white vinegar. Um, so that's something that you want to consider. And I talk more about vinegar washes and vinegar rinses in video two. Um, soap and surfactants. So definitely you're going to want to include at least one of these. Um, you know, either some kind of soap based shampoo or a surfactant based shampoo. Um, so surfactants would be the soapy bits that are in traditional shampoos. Obviously you'll want a sulfate free one for a lox line and um, cocomidopropyl betaine, sometimes also known as cocoa betaine, you see it here from Making Cosmetics, are, is a good option. And I like that one because you can use it by itself. You don't have to add like a second and a third type of thing to it. If you're really considering wanting to do a primary surfactant and a secondary surfactant and you know um, I would say don't over complicate it for yourself most people who are starting out at home that feels hard for them and then it stumps them and then they don't move forward there are places that will sell sell a blend of surfactants for you so then you don't no longer have to consider everything else it's just already blended for you primary secondary you know so any ingredient supplier you just Google cosmetic ingredient supplier in your area. So if you're in Dubai, write Dubai. If you're in, you know, South Africa, write South Africa. If you're um, in the States, write the States and a whole bunch of places should populate for you. Um, so on the left is African black soap. Good old African black soap. A lot of people love it. It is full of minerals because um, instead of regular lye to make soap, it uses um, burnt ashes. Well, I guess all ashes are burnt, right? But um, the ashes of certain plant materials. So it's really, really, really full of minerals for that reason. Um, so a lot of people like um, to use black soap. You would just grate that and then cover it with hot water, hot boiled water, really, um, preferably distilled right um for 24 hours or so and just kind of let it melt um and then you would use that as your surfactant and you could mix that with other things um you know or you could grate it and melt it down and add some things to it and then put it in a silicone bar and make a bar soap out of it i don't know it's up to you how you want to do it but a lot of people have success with that it is um I do find that on its own, it does tend to leave a little bit of a film, I think. Um, so I would follow it up with a vinegar rinse, um, but it works really well to clean the hair and leave it nice and soft and gentle. And then there's good old Castile soap. You could use that as well. I've seen um, quite a few of my students have success making shampoos with Castile soap as the surfactant. So humectants. Oh, another thing about most surfactants is that they do have a high pH. Um, it tends, you know, soap is just generally alkaline in nature. So you're following it up with a vinegar rinse, especially if you're using a soap as opposed to a surfactant based shampoo. Um, that will really, really help. And you can always bring the pH down by adding a few drops of citric acid to your desired pH. So um, glycerin. Humectants. Humectants, like I said, are things that draw water to the surface of the hair or the, the skin, or in our case, the scalp, right? That would be the skin of the head. So um, glycerin is a common one. one. One that I like very much is propane diol because it's not sticky. You can use it at almost any percentage. It is um, a natural alternative to regular glycols. So butylene glycol, propylene glycol are usually pretty toxic, but 1,3-propane diol is derived from fermented corn. Um, so it has a lot of the same product properties of really being able to penetrate the hair shaft and create softness and so forth. Um, you know, we don't really care about detangling with locks, but it, apparently it helps with that too. But it really is um, awesome, softening, humectant 
type of product. It also dissolves oil in small amounts. Um, so it's a nice alternative to using a polysorbate, say for example in the spray, because propane diol is gonna, you know, sort of mix and dissolve a small amount of oil. Um, it is a little bit pricier, but it's worth it. Um, humectants, other humectants, beet extract. I believe they, they sell a powdered beet extract at ingredients to die for here in the United States, and they call it Vegemoist. Um, sorbitol, sorbitol is great. It is a little bit sticky. So for a leave-in product for dreads, you want to use it in a really, really small amount, or you can use it in the rinse out application, like a shampoo or a natural conditioner that's not traditional conditioner, will have to be alternative. Like I said, using things like foaming rights and oats and you know, things like that, and then just kind of let it sit and then rinse out, but with no quats in it. Um, rice solution formulate a sample shop sells a rice solution, so it's kind of a a glycerin alternative like um, I imagine it has a certain amount of natural rice sugars in it because you often see brown rice syrup as a sweetener in natural foods in processed I guess alternative foods in, in health food store and stuff I'm not sure how healthy that is for the body but I know for the hair it's gonna be a nice sort of you know water attracting thing that's not harmful and algae moist, algae moist O, I called it algae moist, I'm sorry, but it's algae moist O, O is spelled E-A-U, like the French way. Um, you can get that from Formulator Sample Shop in both the UK and the United States. Um, and that's going to be also a really nice humectant to include um, anywhere in the line. So butters. Butters um, are nice for twisting products. Um, the ones I prefer are shake, poasu, murumuru, and mango. Obviously, there are other butters. I haven't tried all of them. Like, there's some newer butters out of Brazil and, you know, other butters that are older that I just never tried. But I know that these aren't going to be too hard and therefore not too build up y in the hair. Um, whip them with some. Um, carrier oils. My favorite one for dreads honestly is Shea because it just has the right amount of hold and it's really nourishing and full of minerals and it's one of the few butters that you can get raw. Um, you can get cacao butter or cocoa butter raw as well but it does have a very strong smell that's hard to to mask even with natural fragrances or essential oils so you have to love the chocolatey smell um which i love you know but um not everyone's into it and then um and cocoa butter is just so hard i just feel like it would build up in the hair and you'd have to use it in a really small amount um yeah and so all the other ones work really well also for twisting and and just forming the hair um, sterols, okay, so this is a, a waxy substance that's naturally derived. It's not like beeswax, but it's kind of like a really, it kind of feels like a soft butter when you look at it or feel it. Um, and it has kind of almost like a castor oil sort of um, consistency, but it feels really amazing. It also really, it's an oil that really has a lot of humectant properties surprisingly so adding a small amount in a whipped butter or a small amount melted in an oil might be kind of an interesting touch they are very expensive but a little bit goes a long way and for locks I would not recommend using it more than five to ten percent anyway in whatever product you're using it in um, so you know there's that um, what you want to avoid is waxes so, you know, any of the waxes, beeswax, carnauba wax, um, you know, any of the more artificial waxes, emulsifying wax, olive wax, um, any fatty alcohols like cetyl alcohol, sterol alcohol, behenyl alcohol, um, any of the conditioning agents like um, behentramonium methosulfate, um, you know, 
stearylconium chloride that's kind of waxy, um, even um, stearamidopropyl dimethylamine, I think it is. Anything that's really waxy like that um, feels great in free hair, but in locked hair, even though it'll make it soft, and you know, initially, you know, the first few months or so, it'll seem great. Eventually, it will build up in the hair. And that becomes just too hard to wash out, okay? So carrier oils. So one of the rules with the carrier oils is that you never want to use more than 20% of a heavy or even a medium viscosity oil um, if you must use them in locked hair. In other kinds of hair, you can do which as you please. But um, even natural oils can build up in the hair. And so the heavier they are, obviously they will build up. So if you're going to use a heavy oil because it has amazing properties and there's so many of them that have amazing healing properties, make sure it's not at a percentage greater than 20. And even that is being pretty liberal. Um, you know, so castor, sesame, rose, carrot seed, rose hip, seed buckthorn. Um, and if you're using a, a blend that has 20% of a heavy oil, try, try to keep that towards the scalp and then just make something that's really super light for the hair shaft. So all of these have really great restorative qualities for the scalp. Um, you know, regenerates the scalp, heals the scalp. Um, um, the castor is really gonna help with thickening hair and hair growth. Yeah, the others will also do the same because they're very nourishing. Um, so, you know, just kind of do your research on, on the carrier oils. So the ideal carrier oils that we want for a line for locks are going to be light oils and they can be wet or dry. And for more of an understanding of wet or dry oils, I'll link my video on how to choose the ideal carrier oil in the description box below. But um, really, you know, either will work. It's just really your preference. Um, I usually like a blend of both. Grapeseed oil is my favorite one for locks. Um, I would be happy to use it even just on its own. It's it's that great for locks. It absorbs, um, and even though it's a wet oil, it just is not going to be too greasy, and it leaves the hair feeling really soft. And it works really well in the scalp, too, without building up. Um, sunflower oil is a nice oil. Um, it's really super light. Rice bran works really well. Jojoba, um, and you know, jojoba has the same consistency as the sebum that our scalp produces, so it penetrates easily the scalp without building up. Camellia is a really nice conditioning oil for the hair. Um, Sacha Inchi is one that is great for both scalp and hair. It absorbs really super fast. It kind of has a dry feel, and it has a ton of omegas. Um, almond oil, that's always going to be a great option because it's so inexpensive, right? Mongongo is really, um, it's kind of on the verge of being a medium oil, but not fully medium. So I'd say between a light and a medium oil, but it really is one of those that um, makes the hair feel really, really, really nice. Um, and, you know, it comes from a part of the world where people with 4C hair live naturally and they've used it on their hair forever. It works really well. Watermelon seed is going to be a great light oil for the hair. Marula and baobab are going to be great. Um, apricot cherry and plum kernel are nice. Those are really nice and light. Cherry and plum kernel tend to be a little bit more expensive and not always easy to find, but apricot is really abundant and it's inexpensive. Apricot also has a really nice natural smell too, as do all the stone f stone fruit oils when they're not refined. Okay, next we're going to go on to <clears throat> essential oils. Um, I'm just going to pause the video here so that I can um, clear my throat. So, um, when you're dealing with essential oils, there are many different ones that you can do. Um, there are um, mostly for locks, you're going to be looking at scalp balancing. 
really. Um, any other oil for the actual hair shaft is going to be about scent. But in terms of the scalp, you're looking at scalp balance mostly. Um, so let's move on to see what kind of oils we could use. So ones that are great for scalp balancing, which is really code for itching and dandruff. You're not allowed to say dandruff control um, unless you have some kind of medical super chemical ingredient in there and then even then I mean if you're going to manufacturing you could probably figure it out but if you're working from home what you're going to be allowed to say by the FDA in the United States and probably other places is scalp balancing because it's vague enough and it doesn't really imply anything but really what, what you mean is dandruff control so rosemary sage bay leaf tea tree cedar wood those are all really great for balancing an itchy scalp. And so for growth, um, you're gonna find that a lot of the scalp balancing oils also uh, really work well <laughs> for growth. So patchouli, lang lang, mint, and lavender are going to be really great for growth as well. Um, and you can use them in combination with the other oils to get a little bit of scalp balance in or just on their own. Um, and so some of the oils that I mentioned above are going to be really pungent. So, you know, review the Natural Fragrance Masterclass and I'll link that video as well below um, so you can get scenting options, okay? Because um, there are always natural options you can use to enhance the smell or mask smells or you know and that sort of thing oh i forgot to mention time um t-h-y-m-e time is also going to be great for growing hair as well as cloves clove essential oil is going to be great for growing hair as well i think we're nearing the end of the video thank goodness because my voice is really starting to go um but those are all things excuse me, that you want to look at. So, um, I will see you at the end of the week in the next video, or if you're watching long after this goes up, I'll just see you in video four. And in video four, we'll be discussing what does the actual product line look like now that we've researched the heck out of it. What does it look like? When you go to your chemist, you can say, this is what I want. These are the kind of ingredients I want. This is the kind of effect I'm looking for help a sister out or help a brother out. So if you want more master classes like this, um, I have some that I only share with my email subscribers. Feel free to subscribe to my free newsletter. It's prosperinbeauty.com. And that's also where I share, um, you know, any offers I have to low cost classes and mini courses. And um, if you want coaching, that's also where I usually offer that. So if that's something that's interesting to you, then you can do that. But I believe most people can do stuff on their own. Um, so my tendency is to make information like classes and so forth really low cost. They range from 25 to $50. And then my coaching is really going to be more expensive because it involves my time. So if I'm going to speak to you every single week for a year, then, you know, <laughs> you can expect to pay a lot for that. But most people don't need that. But if you do want it, it's available to you. So thank you so much for watching the video. I hope it was helpful to you. And um, I look forward to seeing you in another video here on YouTube. If you're a subscriber, um, feel free to subscribe. If you've subscribed and you haven't hit the notification button, you might want to. That's the only way YouTube um, notifies people about videos. Otherwise, you could easily be a subscriber and just never see the videos. All right. Thank you so much. Be blessed in your life. I look forward to um, seeing what you create.